I'm a sculptor, mostly portraiture, but I do sort of abstract stuff as well. It all depends on what I'm researching at the time. Often material led, so if it's a material that I've sourced, I'll research it and that then often instigates the path that I'll go down. For this project, I've been really lucky that I'm doing this residency in a working quarry and it's on the bed of the Ancestral Thames. The Ancestral Thames used to flow right the way across Essex on top of the London Basin, a totally different river to what it is today. It was a huge, what we call a braided river, very fast flowing. It was created by all the glacial ice melt, so lots of water, powerful water, bringing all these rocks, pebbles and sands from huge distances over thousands and thousands of years. The quarry is excavating the gravels and sands for the building trade mm -hmm. and infrastructure. Right. But for someone like me, it's, it's, it's just a treasure trove of rocks that I'm thinking, well, where's that from? Where's that from? Yeah. Because no rocks are from Essex. They've all come from somewhere else. I mean, when I first went to the quarry and I was actually standing on the bed of the Ancestral Thames, it was very overwhelming because I thought, oh, you know, this is half a million years old. So I, I, I went to London and I stood on the foreshore and I thought, I thought, oh my goodness, look at the contrast of the Thames foreshore now as to how it was. Yeah, I this mean, I recognise this stuff. calming, cool. You can imagine the, the ice coming off the, the glaciers. And then the, here you've got the Industrial Revolution, you've got man, you've got pottery, you've got pipes. Yeah. You've got this modern history, or, or also what we call now the Anthropocene. And then, of course, I was fascinated by the objects people were finding within this. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I was finding amazing rocks that I got a bit excited about, but then mudlarkers are finding all these little faces. And of course, as a portrait artist, I thought, right. wow, this is amazing. So I first had the inkling as a sculptor that I wanted to recreate these faces, these found faces mm -hmm. from the foreshore to be life-size sculptures, yeah. to present them as equal to us, if you yes, like, rather yeah. than the trinket. Some of them I've recreated exactly the same or tried to. Others I've interpreted slightly different. So, yeah. for example, the two-dimensional salt glaze. Oh, the cherub. He, of course, is just fairly flat, pressed into uh, yeah. a mould. Um, so, I again, to give him his voice and character, he's now three-dimensional with ears and a little pudding bowl haircut. I'm <laughs> just going to go and look at which his ears. he hasn't so got. So he hasn't got ears on no, here. No, he hasn't got ears there. So this is a mudlark's find. This is, is it Richard? It's Richard's, Richard Henry's yes. find here. Yeah. So it's part of a salt-glazed jug. A German jug. salt yeah, a jug. Glazed jug, yeah. And I love, I love this creature, this little character with his arms. So these finds made... Bigger, yes. large, they are part of your new body of work called Force Your Foundlings. That's, That's correct, right. yes. So it, for me, this isn't about recreating the object just to make them bigger. It's about a, a much wider body of work to connect the tidal Thames with the ancestral Thames. Right. So the rocks Aha. are also my foreshore Foundlings, but they're from a different layer in history. For me, it's about the umbrella is the Thames. Right. These go down in a thin layer of history. Yeah. Hundreds of years. Contemporary history. Up, up it, to 2000. Up to 2000 yeah. years. Whereas these objects go right back for millions, millions. of years. <laughs> I knew nothing about geology, rocks or anything until I went into the quarry. And yeah. again, I knew very little about history in general, but just through creating these objects. I've learned so much. Oh, you have actually. You've taught me some things as well. Shamefully, I didn't know much about Wellington either. He was the hardest one to sculpt because unlike the little cherub that was mm -hmm. two-dimensional, I've kept this one because he's a relief. I've not made him three-dimensional yeah, as in yeah, I've given yeah. him a back. Yeah, yeah. 
because if I did that, I would just be replicating the Duke of Wellington, whereas yeah. here it was really important to replicate the fragment because it had everything in it that I wanted. It, mm. it was enough. You've put him next to these. Are they ca they're a bit cannonball-like, aren't they? They are, exactly. So I thought, what rock am I going to do with him? And then I suddenly remembered one of the geologists telling me that there are some flints that are like balls, and they call them cannonball flints. Okay. And I thought, well, what a perfect rock. May I? To, yeah, to pair with the Duke of Wellington. So are these giant nodules? They are. Is that they're, what they they're, are? They're, they're slightly different, because flint is um, fills the burrows of sea creatures oh. um, and oh. these are as far as I'm aware they are sea sponges oh I see and they the silica settles around them and the sea sponges are inside oh, but you very rarely get the original sea sponge but over here, I do actually have. Oh. And a, a lot of, not many people have seen ah. this, but this oh, one, you can, you can see, the, see, it was so hollow. That's the, that's the sea sponge. That's the sea sponge. I don't know if it's the or... top or the, the base, yeah. but that's the fossil imprint. But I actually wonder if, if the surface of the sea sponge has fossilized on there. That's really interesting. But for the Duke of Wellington, the pairing of the rocks to connect him with the ancestral Thames was yeah. was the perfect rock. And you can see on, on the Duke of Wellington, you can see your gold. Why do you put the... Well, so for me, the gold represents highlighting and celebrating the damage as part of the history of the object, mm -hmm. which is similar um, philosophy to work I've done before, which uses the um, ancient Japanese art called Kintsugi yes. to highlight the damage rather than conceal it because it's part of the history of the object. Right. And so you've done that, I can just see a little bit around here on the Chinese mud man. He's <laughs> been more difficult. I'm still umming and ahhing which rock to pair with. Oh, I see. Because this to me, I chose this. This is yeah, that because seems he's like called a, a mud man. Yeah. This is basically fossilized sedimentary silt right. so it's it's mud in itself yeah however the other thing i'm considering as well mm -hmm. is the fact that the chinese we've got connections with the silk and the spice trade mm -hmm. um so i love this idea of paths um and crossed boundaries so these oh. veined quartz um yeah. rocks here there's there's something there that that could be connected that leads us nicely on to yes. the Pilgrim badge. Oh, my favourite. Easily my favourite. So this is Thomas Beckett, who I really, I only knew his name right. because my grandfather's name was Charles Thomas Beckett. Okay. But I didn't realise who he was. You didn't know about the murder and the, the cathedral? No, or, but I do now. Yeah. And honestly, I've learnt so much. And then, of course, all this, these pilgrimages to Canterbury Cathedral. And pilgrim badges are obviously like a big sort after find on the Thames. Yes. Everyone wants to find yeah, pilgrim yeah. badges. This was great because I just looked under the magnifying glass to see the decoration on there and the little face and reinterpreted it. And the rock actually was quite easy for me for this because mm -hmm. of this idea of pilgrimage. So this is a piece of Welsh um, oh, igneous rock. Gosh, that's beautiful. Uh, and it's, fo it's folded so you can see when it was, possibly when it was lava. And I've had it again diamond cut and polished that's so you can see isn't that it? that's my favorite one so I think. to me here there, there's a journey there there's yeah. a path mm -hmm. so i've noticed the rock with the memento mori looks a bit different from the other yes so what? this again when i worked out which rock to use was was a perfect rock for it so the, this is the mem memento mori bead Hand carved in bone, medieval, beautiful, incredible find. And we were saying about this was the thing that started me mm -hmm. off on this journey of sculpting portraits. But because this is about life and death, the living, and you know, we're only here for a short period of time. Remember you will die. Remember of course, the rock had to have been a living ah. thing to start with. So this <laughs> is petrified wood, fossilized wood. So it was a living object which is now 
and it died, died ended up in a bog petrified. or something to preserve it. You can tell it that it's different from rocks because when it's cut open, you get these oranges and reds and yellows yeah, in I mean, there, really which you can see. Yeah, it really comes alive again, doesn't it? When and it's and to me, they're like a family. Right. You know, all of them, the rocks included, they are a family. They've all come from the Thames. Each one has, to me, its own personality, not in just the subject, but also the way it was made. I, I, while I'm making it, I often put myself in the shoes of the original maker. When I see mudlarkers with their finds, they are totally in awe of that find. Mm. They want to research it, they want to look after it. They are the custodian of that object yeah. until someone else, either it gets lost yeah, again, exactly. someone else. You know, it's all temporary custodianship. Yeah. But for me, it was also this relationship of the object to the mudlarker rather than the mudlarker to the object. So does an object have agency, you know? That object gives back to the mudlarker as yeah. much as the mudlarker does with, with their research and the cleaning, the nurturing, the looking after it, the showing of it. This, this is my sort of challenge by researching the work is, and, and by presenting them as life-size, it's then having its own voice speaking back to us. Yeah. You know, we've, I've given them not power, I would say, but, but a, um, a place amongst us.